we should we should not be the coach for every one of you because our coaching style probably isn't going to work as well with all of you. So while we could financially say it's super good for us if we are your coach, that's a fact. But it's also a fact that you're not going to improve in the best way you possibly can. So we want to take a couple minutes to talk about how to find your coach, what you should be looking for in finding a coach. And then we kind of want to open up. We'll say that's the first 20 minutes of this tops. Yeah. 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 Uh, Josh has used a lot of words already today, uh, helping with form. And so we want to talk about that, but then we want to open it up to questions and there are no bad questions. Uh, and we don't judge, let's be real. We judge people oh, constantly. Uh, and that's what coaching is. Uh, but we want you, we want to hear your questions. We want to hear what you want to know about coaching, what you want to know. Uh, so just put that preference out there that this is probably not the like, Hey, can you break down my form right here? No, that line is for Josh later, but the literal line, the literal line. Uh, yeah. So Josh, two different types of coaching out there. We would say, I'm with you. I know where you're going. Smell where you're stepping in. So, Stefan. Technique. Feel. Is that where you're going? No, but I love it. Virtual. That one. In yeah, person. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got there eventually. Yeah. I'm with it. We so, talked about this beforehand. Yeah, it's fine. We planned. Uh, so, virtual, in-person, co- virtual and in-person coaching. But let's talk about the type of student. We ought to talk about the student and then how they would relate to both of those coaching styles. Sure. Blanket statement, if you find the person that you think, like, this is the goat of coaching out there, which probably doesn't really exist, but you're like, this guy's the best. If you can find someone who's half as good as that person and you're with them and they can touch you and see you throw and you can get an in-person lesson, that's way more valuable, I think, than someone who can virtually help you. And that's coming from someone who virtually helps a lot of people. If it's, I've had coaches and like, okay, I'm only two hours away from this person. Like, let's do your, oh, here, came up here. And the guy lives like an hour away. So we did our lesson over at uh, Pyramids. That's way more valuable than every other online lesson I've probably had. Is that proof? Sure. But when you can gather all that data in person, if you can have an in-person coach who has a sufficient amount of knowledge to move you along to it. Yeah, and there's a definition that you've used in coaching that I really appreciate, and it is coaching is the ability to communicate relevant knowledge. So you have lots of players out there who are very, very talented at throwing a Frisbee. Very talented. They are horrific coaches. Because there are so many things that they do subconsciously at this point. If you ask them, tell me about pouring the coffee. Tell me about how I hit nose down. Oh, I just do it. Just you throw it nose down, man. Yeah, just literally, I wouldn't come on. It's easy. They can't. And when they try to break it down, here's how I get it nose down. They actually think it may be this one thing when in reality it's a completely different thing happening. Which also means if you have really good people who are horrific coaches, can you have people that are horrific at throwing a frisbee but be really good coaches? Right. My obvious answer as a trash disc golfer is yes. Um, so communicating relevant knowledge. Um, if they know what, if they can do all the right things but can't communicate it, no good. How can I translate this information to you, right? That's the big thing. Now, the thing that co- that good players have is they can demonstrate a good throw, um, but that seems to be one of the hardest uh, ways for people to understand things. If someone just shows you and just watch, right? Just watching the disc golf throw tour, I'm not actually getting better. I wish, but obviously that doesn't just translate. So that's one heart if like a really good player could put into words and they can put you into body positions and it 
communicate the things that you needed, then yeah, if they have everything that I had, plus they could show you, like, plus they could demonstrate 650 feet, then sure, like, why not, right? But usually they have that one piece and they miss all the communication aspects, right? And then there's communication of relevant knowledge. Like, if I look at any one of you, you probably have 15 things wrong at any given time. Same here. Um, but we don't want to do whack-a-mole coaching where it's like, okay, yep, make sure X step's good. Oh, yeah, yeah, make sure you bend over. Oh, yeah, yeah, make sure you do this other thing. Oh, your X step's crap again. It's like you did five throws, and they described five different things wrong. And it's like, I don't even got the first thing right, bro. Like, just give me some time to work on this one thing. Um, so just... uh communicating knowledge that is relevant to you at that time that allows you to focus you can get that through you. so and that's why i think yeah so there are there are there are way more students than there are coaches right now in disc golf so before we dive into finding your coach whether you should be looking for virtual or in person i love the idea that josh said right of like in person is always going to win and it should win and there are people in your area that probably can coach and you can go to them. But when it comes to the type of student, you need to identify as the type of student that you are. And we kind of separated it into, I would say, three different categories. The first is someone like a Holland Hanley, who is very knowledgeable about disc golf form, proven, able to implement those changes. Holland doesn't need a coach working with her every week. Does it need a coach working with her every month? Maybe once a quarter, three times, four times a year for those of you not business. Had to learn about quarters recently about money. Uh, so Holland is this extreme. There are so many people that watch a lot of form videos and they're like, wow, I'm Holland. I don't need to work with a coach on a regular basis. I know form. And you can find most of those people in a Facebook group called Disc Golf Form Check. They're the ones commenting on your form, telling you, oh, you need to know this and this and make sure the wind's blowing at 14 degrees behind you because you're going to be able to do that. Most people are not hauled. There is also a large, there's a group of people that are on the opposite end of the spectrum that are, I don't know much about form at all. And I really don't know much about my body at all and how to put it in the proper positions. So you're telling me that I need to do this and okay, yeah, I think that I'm doing this, but I'm not doing it well. And I'm, I'm like the feel versus real connection of your body to your mind, very poor. Because we have people that have a great feel versus real connection. Like uh, we've worked with Dylan Cease before, who's a professional athlete professional MLB pitcher. You tell him to tilt at 45 degrees and he just does it. Uh, like, great. Dilla doesn't know anything about disc ball form. So that's, once again, professional. Weird. So there are lots of people who find themselves in the opposite end of Holland. Those people need to be working with a coach on a regular basis because those people are also very usually dedicated to trying to fix their form. So they're going to the field on a regular basis. They're throwing a lot on a regular basis. And it could be hard as a coach working with that student because since they don't know a lot about their form, they don't know a lot about their body, we are constantly trying to un, like unwork, maybe is the right way, habits that they keep re-ingraining into their form. And then you have the middle ground where lots of people are. Most of you in this audience, I have to assume, are here. You have decent understanding of your body and what it's supposed to do. And you've probably seen a four video or two and you know, hey, this is where I fit. How often do you think those people should be working with a coach, Josh? Yeah, so if you have fallen, you say, yo, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You don't see her for three months and it's all fixed. And you're like, whoa, that's crazy. And you got this guy over here who's like, you have to watch him every second because he's trying to turn around as far back as he can get during his next step. If you don't watch him, it's like one of those statues, like you know that they're moving. But the second you look away, like they're doing the wrong stuff again. Anyways, that's like a doctor or anything. Um, Good reference. Yeah. Good reference. We watch Pop Culture. Yep. <laughs> that episode's like eight years old. Yeah. So 
And then you've got these people who it's like, okay, I need to come to you and I'm pretty good at working on my stuff. I've just got to know what I'm actually looking for. Like, I don't, I see all these things wrong and I understand they're wrong, but which do I attack first? I just need an attack plan. And those people were like, yeah, you can check in basically once a month. It's like, okay, here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what the drill is. Reach out if you need anything. And then they don't reach out. And the next month, it's like, all right, I fixed it. Um, but it just like took a lot of work. And I had to stare at myself in a mirror doing all these things. I checked out my video a lot. And so like they knew, they were able to look. They were self-aware enough. They had enough connection to like what was happening with their body to correct. That's not everyone. So basically... You got to find out which of those you are and be realistic about that. Um, coaches and athletes are very just black and white about things. It's just like, yep, that sucked. Oh, nope, I know I'm bad at that. It's like, dude, be positive. And it's like, for them, it's just, this is black and white. I'm good at this. I'm bad at this. You know, but good athletes are always aware of their strengths and their weaknesses. See post-round interviews with someone and they're like, yeah, on hole seven, that upshot I did there. Um, I really should have went to this disc and then hole eight and then list off like every hole and what they did right or wrong. You're like, how do they do that? It's because that's like how their mind works. This went wrong, this went right. And then it's just very cut and dry. Let's go to work and fix it. That's not everybody. So by show of hands, how many of you in the audience right here have ever done or like witnessed or seen physical therapy been done before? Like had any type of rehab, anything like that? Okay, keep your hands up. Uh, I assume people get injured all the time. Uh, the body is horrific. So, uh, okay. So for all of you, how many of you have ever lied to your physical therapist before about saying that you, uh, put your hand out if you never lied about it. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So most of you know this. So as a coach, Josh, how many times have you ever had a session with someone and you're like, Hey, we met last month. I told you that you need to fix this right here. And they're like, bro, I've been doing that, but. Have you ever thought about back foot disc golf? Have you ever thought about we this? Step from that one right there. Uh, um, yeah, I've had students. I used to. I used to do this, and uh, I will admit that I don't do it anymore um, because just the volume of students I have, and I got lazy, I guess. But I used to. After every session, I would write down the homework that I gave them and everything for that person to go on. Then my clientele grew quite a bit, and. Yeah, I got complacent, I think. But this one guy came in. He was like, yeah. I was like, okay, wh what have you been working on? Yeah, I've been working on this thing. And it's a phrase that I would like never say and never tell anyone to work on. I'm not going to say what it was. But uh, he's like, yeah, I, I've been working on this. And I'm like, okay. And he just talks for like the first five minutes on the things he's been working on. And I'm like, all right, but the video you sent me, all everything you just mentioned out of the three or four things in my notes that I told you to work on, you didn't mention one of them, and none of them are fixed. So now we're in this lesson, and, like, you're wasting both of our time and your money. Like, if you want to do that, that's fine, but really, it's better if you just go to this other coach who obviously you're getting this information from and work with them. Like, I don't care if you work with me or him, but it's not good for anybody if you're indecisive on which coach you're following. Like... Pick a coach that you trust and then trust them and work with them for six months. And if you don't see results in six months, then reevaluate. But like, you've got to commit to your coach. You can't be like, okay, well, listen to that guy and this guy. Oh, and this YouTube video over here. And don't be uh, deceived here. Uh, you will, if you are watching and consuming all of someone's content, you are being coached by them. So if you're just like, yeah, I'm taking information from everywhere. Look, I don't like censor the information that goes into our Discord. We talk about stuff. But uh, also, don't be a student of multiple coaches. So I just fired that student. He didn't come back. So, And that's better for everybody because that wasn't going to be a fun lesson for me. He wasn't going to get anywhere because he's just got to keep doing other guys' stuff. And it's like different methodologies. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's... Like, I, I think from a standpoint, right, of, like, even how we attack coaching in general, right? Like, when you work with a student, I've heard you talk about before, right? Like, we're going to focus on some upper body pieces, get the upper body, like, set, right? And then we're going to do some footwork for a little bit. Like, 
when I start with people, I start with footwork, and then I go up. I'm not saying either are wrong. Right. It's where you approach from, right? So if you're if you come and do two lessons with me, and you're like, wow, yeah, I didn't get any distance, so then you jump over to Josh. You're setting yourself back further and further. So I love that idea of working with a coach. And also there are so many YouTube coaches out there that are doing great things. Like I mentioned them. I think slingshot is getting results for people. And there are people that need to trust the slingshot process and lean into that. But don't go two weeks in the slingshot process and then turn around and come to us and be like, Hey, double move ain't working for me. What do I need to do? Trust the slingshot process. Yeah, you can come to me and like, yeah, I've been working on my double move. I'm gonna be like, what do you want me to do? I don't teach double move. I teach not to double move. Right. So you better pick one. Yes. They're conflicting things. And then there's the whole issue of like, there are conflicting things, right? There are things that are like, like footwork first or upper body work first. This happened in tennis all the time. They had like the Spanish mesh method, which was like, these guys could run. They just taught them to get to every ball and they just like, get there, get there, get there. And then you'd have these guys with perfect form coming from the U.S., but it doesn't matter if you have perfect form at the balls, way over here. Like, you're just not going to have perfect form if it's right over there or over here if you can't move. So it's like both methods work, but you're going to have to work upper body with the American method first, and then you're probably going to have them slow. You just don't have very fast Americans. And then you have Carlos Alcaraz over here from the Spanish method just gets stinking everything and destroys people. Um, cause he can get every ball back into play. Same thing happens at disc golf, footwork first, upper body first. Okay, cool. And then we've got stuff that's like, like, is this actually hurtful to teach this? Or is this like, should this actually not be in any coaching out there at all? And we can hopefully not talk about some news today, but you know, yeah. they're out there. Yeah. And I think like. One thing that I respect about Josh, I know he hasn't had it happen on his channel. We've done it on my channel is that because we are actively coaching people, we also learn, Hey, that was wrong. Like that was just straight up wrong. Yep. And so there are videos that were published to the internet and we said, yeah, that's good. We should teach this. And then we realized, Oh, should do that. So we pull it now. That's they like still find it somehow. Yeah, like I feel like how does he? How do you guys still see this video, anyways? So, there is, there's like coaching is an ebb and flow. So when it comes to how to find your coach, and I want to kind of close this here so we can open this up for questions y'all have, so it doesn't end up with us just like sharing our random thoughts or burning bridges along the way. Uh, we, you have your types of students. There's obviously some trust process that needs to happen with your coach. Lean into it. So virtual versus online. Or virtual versus off. Wow, that was super good. Virtual versus in person. So in person, there are local pros that sit at like your course that sit and do that. Trust the process with them. I would always encourage you to start with that in person guy. See what they are, see what their rates are, things like that, right? Trust them for six months. If you're not seeing those results, Know the type of student you are and tell your coach that, hey, they'll figure it out pretty fast, but like, I need to do lessons every other week. I need to do lessons once a month. What would you charge for that? Make sure that your coach that you're trying to work with is equipped to work with you. If someone approached me, it was like, hey, I need lessons every week. I would tell them I'm probably not the in-person coach for you because I don't have time to work with you every single week. But Jared and my hometown does have the time to work with you every other week. So he has two students. Fantastic. Jared's a great coach. Work with him. Make that relationship very clear on the front end. When you go to the virtual side of things, once again, there are a multitude of ways to find coaches right now. There are two coaching academies that have popped up in the last three months. I feel like Pulse and, uh, um, what's you? Is you like Power, Power yeah. S Golf, Power and GA, yeah. That one. It's Yuli's. Yuli coaching. You'll find it. There's positives to that. Find your process. Lean into it. Trust it. And I would also encourage you, just because you like the person, doesn't mean 
that you need to like have them as your coach. Sometimes that is, that actually backfires pretty fast. Like I like this person and they're going to say some things to me that are not going to feel good because the coach should be calling me out for my form. People who have me as a coach, they're like, that's not the, the smiley Robbie C I see on videos. Cause that's not going to get you making butts. Uh, like your putt form is just bad. Sorry, uh, but you're going to be smiling more if you made more butts. So we need to work on that. So I would definitely like the multitude of coaches find and do a little research. Like at this point, research their students as well. Hey, I went and did this. Like I, I kind of love when you see like a Reddit thread or something that's like, I bought a $300 lesson with Yuli. How was it? Right. And you get real feedback. And you get to make the decision on that. Was it worth it? Was it not? Yeah. At the end of the day, a good coach is one that gets their students' results. Not immediate results, but results. I will say, and my worst, my least favorite type of student. So if you're thinking about getting a coach, don't do this. Um, when someone's like, yeah, they should open up the lesson. I had a lesson with so-and-so and, uh, like one lesson, right? I had a lesson with so-and-so and, uh, you know, whatever. And they start like bad mouthing other coaches. What the first lesson I'm thinking like, man, they're going to take one lesson with me and then go bad mouth me to someone else. It's like, as a student, you have to take total responsibility for your game. Now I take total responsibility for your game as well. Not in terms of credit because the student does all the work, but I try to do everything in my power to make sure like, okay, like I really feel bad and it's a big fear of mine if someone's just like, ugh, like they're just working, work. I see them putting the work and they're not getting it. I feel really bad, right? Mikey does a good job of telling me like, it's on the student. It really is on the student. And uh, if you're one of those people who just like gets information from everywhere, gets a little coaching from this guy and, ah, oh, it doesn't quite work out. Let me go try someone else. It's like, no, probably you're the problem, not the coach, right? There are a lot of um, people out there who have done really good with bad information, Right, so I'm not trying to say that to kind of poo-poo on all you guys, uh, but don't do that, right? Trust the coach. Try to take total responsibility where you can. That's what these pros are doing with their games is the people who get there, who improve, is they're totally cutthroat about what the issue is. It's not like, oh, yeah, my, uh, I'm, my backhand's pretty good. All right, that person is never going to improve because they don't see that the problem is them, right? So don't make the problem your coach. Don't make the problem a lack of knowledge. Like, oh, I just don't know the right thing. I have to watch another video when there's some golden nugget out there that I'm missing, some piece of information that's going to get me throwing 500 and impressing my friends. No, it's like the fundamentals. There are a few things that you have to do well, and it takes a lot of sinking work to do them. And at the end of the day, a coach tries to communicate what those things are to you. But at the end of the day, you have to do the work. So it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I don't know why I felt like saying that. Uh, I guess I just felt like saying it. Not the, the coaching student relationship, it's you don't have to know more because that's the job of the coach. And if you feel like the coach isn't communicating that to you and you're like, hey, I'm not learning. Once again, I'm not saying they're necessarily a bad coach immediately for that but they just may not be the right coach for you. And that, that's, that's the biggest thing in finding your coach is one lesson, never good. Lead into it, trust it. So we want to take a moment, unless you got something else you want to say, Josh. No, I want to open it to the people. Yeah, I, I'll address like the, but where to start, right? Uh, so I think as we we see some of the, you talking about starting the lawnmower, uh, like the guy who really taught me how to play uh, is a guy named Tom Monroe, PGGA number 33, uh, freestyle guy uh, who got into disc golf, like won so many world titles. Incredible human make. He learned how to play disc golf in a world where the fastest flying disc was an eagle. And so when you watch the climbos running around in the beautiful shorts and they're playing in Huntsville, doing their thing, and it's, 
it's an amazing thing to watch. The game has evolved because the technology of the discs have evolved. So I would say if you're watching a video, you can pretty contextually figure out like, okay, what am I, what equipment am I watching this person hold and throw in the video? And that should somewhat inform what I'm doing. Now you also have people like Danny who made videos eight years ago at this point, I feel like. Like the proper Danny Lindahl or sitting with the cats running around, like that's about an eight year old video. Most of what Danny's teaching is still pretty good. Uh, coaching is constantly evolving. We are learning more as we go through and we're learning it because we're coaching people along the way. Uh, it's not just Josh sitting in his apartment, theory crafting going, Oh, that makes sense. Let's make a video about it. It's because he's tested this theory out with students working through that process. Um, but I think there's, there are still things that we learned from some of the older videos that are worth watching that are important. Um, so in terms of like filtering the information, I think Josh kind of addressed that as well. Like there's conflicting information out there on the internet for sure. Uh, and I, we can't just go through and purge it and be like, blacklisted, blacklisted, that's bad, that's terrible, don't watch that guy. Because I think that's just a really poor way to do it, like for lack of a better answer. Uh, but yeah, I would say coaches, coaches that are currently out there actively coaching, actively doing things, and if we're still creating content, like look for active channels that are doing it and that will help find what information to be watching because most of the active channels are learning alongside and doing the process as well. Um, but even like just because they have a large following doesn't mean that they're still the right following is another important thing. I think it just because they have the numbers behind them, like Seabass teaches some really good stuff and has a really small following inside of the grandeur of disc golf coaching. But Seabass is also an OG who has been doing this for a long time, but he's still like actively putting out videos and he's still active in the coaching community. So I think you could easily look at a Seabass video and you could look at an overthrow video and you could go production quality is a little different there. I got to watch the overthrow video. And that's not saying the Seabass is bad. Like Seabass is teaching good things. So yeah, there's a filter. I know that's probably not the most helpful answer, but I truly, I would look at like, is this video, is the person who made this video still creating relevant content? Like, are they still doing this? And that should be the start of your filter instead of my guy, Tom, who is still sitting outside of Bronze Springs in Huntsville, Alabama, selling people starter sets and telling them to start the lawnmower. And then they come down and I'm like, Tom, my guy, I love you guy. Please stop. Uh, like that's going to get them throwing well for a little bit. And then they're going to work with someone and they're going to be like, Hey, let's not do that. Um, kind of a deal. Yeah. So with, with you, for example, the coach, it's really a creative thing. If I have a lesson with you and I have a lesson with a seven year old kid, the way I teach has to be totally different, right? And this is part of what makes a good coach is modifying instruction to the student. So people ask me like, do you have like a beginner? Like, can you make this? Like so-or-so has this um, series or this uh, course. Like when is your course going to come out? It's like one, is way too. it feels way too early in the process for you to do that. But two, and probably more um, pertinent to this point is that every person is so different that it's almost like everyone starts in a different place. You can't send everyone down the same path, right? I can't send you down the same path as your 18-year-old grandson because you can bend over at the waist this much and he can fold over like a lawn chair, right? And folding over like a lawn chair is extremely beneficial to the throat, like being able to have that flexibility. So in terms of the cues that you use, like starting a lawnmower, I've probably used that cue three times out of thousands of lessons, but the point there is that I've used it. There are three people out of like a thousand that I think this cue is helpful to use, and it's my job as a coach to find out, like, is this cue helpful? 
because I don't really care if starting a lawnmower looks like the correct thing. If I say start the lawnmower and then you turn into Eagle McMahon, I'm going to say, hey, start the lawnmower every time, brother. Mowing all day, baby. Like, that's what part of coaching is. And then you kind of learn, and disc golf isn't in a place right now where we can say, or where a lot of coaches know how to modify based on demographic or what do we call that? Like where people are in life, like with kids, you don't go, okay, so into the power pocket, it goes here and then out of your chest, it's probably about a 130 degree angle out of the chest. A kid's never, doesn't even know what 130 degrees is, right? Um, unless it's like part of a video game. Um, but with an engineer or something like that, it might be helpful to give them exact numbers. And might say, for some people, it's like, okay, get this thing about 90, about 90, and you're good to go. But in actuality, we know it's not really 90 here. It's a little bit more. But the coach individually is trying to find the cues that work for you. Coaching is brain hacking. So I say something that makes you think something that makes you do the right thing. And all I'm doing is beep, boop, bop, boop, and all the different cues in there until I find, find one. I say one, and it works. And I say one, and I'm like, start the lawnmower. And you're like, I'm like, okay, cool. I don't usually use that cue. Usually I say start the lawnmower. It's like, Ugh. like, no breaks. Um, so, but I'm not against using that verbal cue. Um, so I will lie to you if it gets you doing the right thing. Straight up. I'm utilitarian. And when I'm working with somebody, the issue is if you then go and you tell all your friends, start the lawnmower. Right? That's what I don't want to happen. So coaching is so individual based that you have to find the coach that can translate and find your cues to get you to do the right things. Not only that, but they got to know, like, you're probably not going to be able to bend over as much as your grandson. So I can't plug him into that same machine and expect the same results. So I'm going to have to work with different um, weights, plastics, stabilities. I'm going to have to give up some proper form things based on your limitations, right, with kids. You'd give less details with adults. You can give more details with engineers. You got to stop getting to think so much because they just try to think about all 17 things that throw at one time. So stop thinking, right? When with someone who's like really feely and doesn't think about anything, you got to get them starting to think about something to correct it because like everything they do is just natural and that's great until they reach like a point where it's like, I can't go any further. And it's like, okay, well, have you thought about this one thing, Mikey? And then it's like, oh, I think about that one thing. And then boom, the disc goes further. It's super annoying to watch those people, but they have to learn to think. Engineers have to learn not to think. Um, and so it's so individually based, and you have to have the confidence in that coach that they can find which buttons of yours to push. And eventually we're going to get to the point where coaches are like, this one's really good at finding those buttons for kids. So if I have my 18-year-old, they go to this coach. If I have my older client, they go to this coach. If I have my kind of athletic guy and they go to this coach unfortunately we don't have the volume of coaches right now and the experience there to have that separation and have that specialization so you got to kind of hope that one guy can do it for all of them or a gal okay so 30 seconds or less recap is questions question is we don't have these volume coaches how can we find them first facebook in your local facebook group is a good option you have YouTube coaches that are giving virtual lessons. That's a good option. Um, you could also go through PDGA and search by state and see some of these like local pros. I think probably the sweet spot is someone who's like struggling to get on pro tour because they're not like quite that athletic. But anyways, I think Facebook probably trumps your local Facebook group probably trumps that. Yeah. In the order. Yeah, it's funny because like Facebook is a medium that I feel like is largely dying, and yet yeah, disc golf is like highly living on Facebook. I know lots of disc golfers who have a Facebook simply to be in Facebook groups. Like that's something we've traveled a lot going to different communities. And the first thing we do when we're going to go visit somewhere is we're like, all right, let's join their Facebook group. No, 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 because People are so individual, right? You're always going to have individual problems. Again, the way that you think about something, I just think about, well, you're not married yet, but I was going to say, think about how you think about the dishes, right? If there were one way that you and your spouse 
could get on the same page of how to do dishes, would your life be way easier? It's like, do the forks go up like this or do they go down in the bottom like this? Do you rinse everything? And is it sparkling clean before it goes into this water? It's like the way that we think is different, right? So it doesn't change for disc golf form. The way that you think about the throw is different than the way that I think about the throw. Some people, again, different cues get you to do different things. And so unless you can get everybody thinking the exact same way, there will never be a standardized process. Plus, the sport will grow because people will try out random stuff. Somebody will just get frustrated and they're not throwing far, and they'll try, instead of doing a 360 this way, they'll go the other way, and then they'll throw back, or they'll do something crazy, right? It used to be on the high jump, uh, people used to not go over back first on the high jump, right? And then one day, this guy tried it. Now everybody goes to the high jump that way, right? But before that, they were just like scissor kicking over, right? And then this guy's like, forget that. Boom! And now guess what? Standard practice. Next time, somebody's just going to like dive over that thing. And then that's going to be standard practice. People create and people try to improve. The competition improve, like creates these little moments where people like try to just do it better. And then there's these like really handful of creative people that are like, what if I did a 360 and threw this thing? Right? Think about that. 360 was not the way to go for however long. It didn't start that way. And somebody's like, I bet you I could just eat this thing if I went 360 mode on it. And now it's like distance comps. A lot of people doing 360s. Um, not all of them yet, but there's always going to be innovation and people are always going to be unique. Therefore, we will not have one way of doing things. And that's called job security. Yeah. And I, I think that something that got mentioned in the question here was there's not a form of accreditation uh was the word that's thrown out there uh and as disc golf as we learn more about disc golf form as we study more in disc golf form i think that that accreditation will happen i think there will be a moment where coaches are like hey you if you can walk through this test uh like i i straight up didn't know how the coaching uh, like the tennis coaching certification process worked, but like hearing about it from these guys, I love it because there's a knowledge portion and then there's a literal coaching portion where someone who is certified is going to watch you coach and say, Hey, you are good at coaching. Here you go. Hey, you have the ability to communicate relative information. You are certified. And what that means is when you book a coach, you know that they know their stuff instead of Bob who's sitting there at your local course and he's like, hey, bro. Bob, man. For 50 bucks, I, uh, you guys want to throw four on? No, I, uh, 50 bucks, 50 bucks. Like, I'd rather spend those 50 bucks outside of like the Boston Celtics arena and hopefully get a decent seat, right? Like, that's going to happen, but then it's going to play back to this world of, okay, Bob did actually know what he was doing. And he got passed. So Bob has a little sticker. And when you see Bob pushing his 50 bucks, you're like, yeah, this is worth it. But also Bob is a, like, he specializes in working with certain people. So now I can go find Bob in that organization. So I think it's still job security of like, Josh has worked with enough people at this point. Very good at general knowledge. I have a ton of students that are juniors. I love that aspect of things fantastic like that's where yeah you just kind of you get that specialty and i i kind of appreciate yeah that it won't be uniform yeah. and then eventually you'll be able to go on that certification website and find your coach by location yeah that's an excellent question um man i oh, it, it it hits a soft spot because i i can I would need so many hands to count the number of lessons I've had with someone. And we get to the end that I'm like, man, so like, just tell me like, what do you want to do with disc golf? And they're like, yeah, I think in two years I'm going to be on the broach one. And I'm like, are you quitting your job? Uh, like, is that how you're getting there? Uh, so I get that mentality. As a coach, my goal in every session is to have I go back to when we all played our first round of disc golf. 
there was likely a moment when you played your first round that you hit a putt for what felt like was 50 feet away. Reality, you may have been like 15 feet away. But you hit this putt, or you had a... I love when this happens, when people get a throw in and their first ever round. They're like 50 feet away. They had no idea what they were doing. They just slung that disc, and it went in, and they lost their mind. They were like, this... This is my personality now. Like, I get it. I love to ha try to have that moment with every student during a lesson, which is where we identify, we come away with something that's like, I want to have that moment and have them focus on that and be like, hey, you have improved here, but understand this is such a taste of it. And the person I point to more than anyone right now is actually Gannon Burr. Because Gannon, we watch Gannon and we're like, wow, that kid is crushing it. But Gannon got into disc golf basically in infancy. So we have watched him. He did make disc golf his personality. So when I'm working with people, it is give them something that's going to make them realize I can put in a little bit of work and I'm going to see a little bit of positivity, a little bit of a result. How much more and like give them that taste. Yeah. Of coaching has done this. Uh, but also I, I try not to in a one lesson, identify all of their problems or all of that. But if you feel that vibe, and this, this is where I'm going to get a little controversial here. And Josh may shoot me down for this. See, you did. I kind of will squash their dreams at the end of a lesson. Like, if I see that vibe, I'll be like, dude, I totally get that. Real fast, like, just can we work on, like, upshots or something? And I'll end the lesson teasing them with something else that I know they are not going to succeed at. Because that instantly pulls them back in and they're like, ah, but then after we finish that moment, we go right back to the positive of, but dude, I'm super pumped for you because that, uh, that, that drive you hit with that leopard was amazing. And I can't wait to see when we have our next lesson, how much further you're throwing that leopard because of that. Yeah. So I think first off, awesome to hear a female coach. I haven't met one of those yet. This is sick. Um, I never squash the dream. I never clip the wings, right? If they want to dream big, like there's no, there's nobody that got there that didn't dream big, I think, right? So at some, in some way you have to believe that it's a possibility and that you got to go for it. But, um, I want to be very real about what the workload required for their goal is, right? And for that, as a coach, you have to know what the workload is. So when I tell people, when I open up clinics and stuff like that, it's like, hey, we're going to talk for three hours on this stuff. There's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about in these master classes. You need to get one or two things from this. And if you have other things like you're interested and you just can't get them out of your head, write it down. But you get one or two things you're going to work on. And for most of us, it's going to take us two months to get one form change in because Unless you're a pro and you're practicing six, seven times a week for a couple hours a day, you are not going to get that from not having it to now I can do it in a tournament situation. That takes two months at minimum for most people because they've got these things called jobs and they don't get to go and do quality work. So I would never crush the dream, but I'd say, okay, you want to be pro tour? Here's what that's going to look like. Um... Here, a pro during their three month off season will spend the whole off season working on like two things, like one big form change and then something else. And you like, so don't think it's okay to think that you want to get there in a dream that you're going to get there, but don't be uh, delusional about the amount of work that it's going to take. So here's what it looks like. I happen to know the things that Holland Hanley was working on in the off season. It was three things. She, like, I was, she was like, hey, how's it? She sends me a text. Hey, how's this look now? I'm like, okay, looking a little better, but it could be this. I go off doing my day. I'm doing something different. I come back home, and it was like three hours later, and she sends me another text. 
How's it looking now? I'm like, what are you talking about? Have you been throwing this whole time? And she's like, yeah, man, I just got out there and I was throwing like a, like just through a couple hundred more drives. I'm like, well, is your arm okay? Like, are you good? <laughs> but she was out there the whole time. You know how many people are going to do that and do it the right way? Like, if you don't do it correctly and in large quantities, you are not going to, like, the reason Hall and Hanley is improved so quickly is because she puts in way more time than everybody else and way better time than everyone else. So, I don't clip the wings, but you better, like, just, okay, what's your goal? Okay, I, I want to throw 350 um, controlled. Okay, what are you throwing now? 250. Okay, well, we got to get you to 400. This could take a year, right? If you're willing to put in X amount of work. Oh, well, I work these days. I only get out and play once a week. Okay, well, that's an unrealistic goal for the amount of time that you're willing to put into this, right? So you either got to up your time or you're going to change your goal. But just make them aware of the work that it takes for the problems. And then you won't have to, you won't have to crush their dreams. They'll just do it themselves. They'll be like, I can't put in all that time. Are you crazy? I'm I, I'm not crazy. I'm just telling you what it takes. Well, you should be telling me I can't make it, <laughs> right? They won't say that, but anyways, you don't have to clip the clip the wings. I think. Next, I'll say I think we got time for one more because we got another fantastic session coming after this. Okay, so one of the big things that, yeah, like. I've learned that the left arm and the left side is not nearly as important as I thought it was. Um, I think it's way more passive than I originally thought. Um, I'm currently teaching. It's very, very passive. Find me two years ago, coming from tennis background, where we did like load on the back, let it explode and stuff like that. I pulled it all over from tennis. Turns out it's not exactly the same, a little bit different. And uh, so I reneged on that. And uh, so that's one thing right there is I don't think I don't think this back arm drives rotation. I think it collects tight to the body and then you throw out with the arm. Uh, I think one thing I have learned on. So I spend a lot more time with my my coaching is a lot more like on course. Uh, so I do a lot of like strategy rounds is what we call them. So I like walk with you and I watch you blithe and I'm like, hey. You have really horrific decision making. This is not good. Uh, like you keep throwing this shot over and over again. Um, so something I've learned is for a long time on my channel, I taught the beauty of an overstable pun approach disc. Like it's just a band aid that you can slap on over and over again. I have a whole mantra of pig is love, pig is life. Um, I spend a lot more time putting people on neutral approach discs now, uh, because a neutral approach disc can still accomplish the same thing that an overstable punt approach disc does. Uh, and I realized that the more people I put on these overstable, like super overstable discs, um, I'm just, I'm confusing my students by saying, you don't need really overstable discs in your bag. By the way, you need a disc that's arguably one of the most overstable types of discs ever. Uh, and you need to throw it all the time. Uh, so from that aspect, like just strategically, I think people need more like ringers in their bag than they do zones. Uh, I think people need more pures in their bag, throwing them like zones than they do pigs. Kids just take shots at zones. I have a form thing as well, but I'm a bit there. Yeah. Um, putting, spin putting. I used to think, this is weird that we're getting into details here. I used to think that you wanted less wrists in spin putting, but the idea is that you actually want, probably want less elbow and more wrist in spin putting. Now that we're talking about random, random stuff that I've flipped on. Next. Uh, so I used to think that like coming from a baseball background, I feel like the hip engagement and baseball swings were huge. Like when you watch a baseball player hit, their hips hit so hard. And then watching in disc golf, I think that the hips do hit, but it is like the lower half is way less dramatic than we like to make it look. And so being a guy that was starting, I was a ground up coach. I was getting my students like, this is how you should like, fl like front foot should plant perpendicular to your target. 
And I was like, nah, dude, jack that thing up. Like get it pointed like backwards and land and realizing that I was causing my students' hips to be so far back that I, in order to get them remotely close, it had to be a dramatic hit. And just like a simple shift was everything they needed. I can't think of anything else. I mean, there's a lot of like things that fall into the first like left side being a lot less involved. How was our Maple Hill round? Amazing. It was cold. Yeah. I, okay. So this will be a good way to end coaching uh, because I put out a series. Uh, there was two weeks to Maple Hill. So I advertised, hey, it takes a long time to work on your form, but I'm wrong. I'm going to be a real professional disc golfer for the next two weeks. And I spent three to four hours working on my form literally every day for the last two weeks. My arm hates me for it. Uh, so, but I said, that's what it would take to be a professional to do this and implement form change. Uh, I have never been more nervous for a round than driving up to Maple Hill because I thought, did coaching actually work? Did Mike and I accomplish anything? Am I successful? The exact that, thing we teach our students not to think. Because hypocrisy is the way of life. So The way of coaches. Yeah, so that's what I thought heading into this. And I was like, wow, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to base the entire success of coaching on this round right here. This tournament right here. And when we pulled up, I thought the snow was bad at Pyramids. What a fun reveal that was when we had to literally scrape the snow off of hole one golds and we're like using our, the back of our shoe as a, like a chisel trying to break the ice off. And I would be honest, I was not helpful in that process at all because I'm sitting there staring at this, still thinking to myself, this is all that matters. Like... If you can't throw, if I can't over, throw over the pond, pond, you quit coaching. Yeah, like I'm deleting Robbie C. Disco. We're done. Uh, and then I just realized, wait a minute. This is not a good setting at all. This is not good footing. This is a dumb idea. My success is not just this round, just this shot. My success is, did I actually learn? And am I a better coach based on what Mike's taught me in the last two weeks? And the answer is absolutely. So the effect that that will have is huge. So when you go find your coach after the seminar, don't base it on one round. Don't base it on one tournament, one week. Let the results speak for themselves over time. Are you a better disc golfer six weeks, six months from now? Are you a better disc golfer at the end of your time where he went your coach? That's great coaching. Josh is a great coach working with him. Thank you for coming. Peace.